Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Baim. I'm one of the curators in the Department of Medieval Art and the Cloisters, and the curator lucky enough to be responsible for the Game of Kings exhibition at the Cloisters now, this uh, exhibition which runs through April 22nd of a substantial nut part of the hoard, the really extraordinary hoard of ivory chess pieces of the 12th century found on the wonderful Isle of Lewis in 1831. This afternoon we've asked three speakers um, who focus uh, on this material, either on the game of chess itself or on um, these ivory carvings, to talk to you about the game and about the um, art of chess um, and to give you a broader perspective. Um, which It's not so important that you hear me because I'm just introducing the speakers, but I think it is important that you know something about them. So our first speaker this afternoon is Dylan McLean. Dylan McLean has been affiliated with the New York Times for 18 years. An informational graphics editor, he is also responsible for writing a chess column for the Times. When I began to plan the exhibition, The Game of Kings, I became an avid reader of Dylan's columns both current and archived, since he has been writing them since November of 2006. Sometimes I must admit I was rather intimidated by Dylan's exp expertise. I simply didn't speak chess. At other times I was surprised and even astounded when I read, for example, that Howard Stern is an avid chess player. In the process of reading these columns, I realized that Dylan McLean is a sort of evangelist of chess keeping it in the news and on people's minds and trying to bring people to the good news of the game of chess. Mr. McLean considers himself a product of the Bobby Fischer boom. He, along with tens of thousands of other Americans, learned to play in 1972 when Fischer was on his way to winning the World Chess Championship. But Dylan severely outpaced the rest of the pack and is a chess master currently ranked among the top 150 players in the United States. Finally, I'm pleased to report that Dylan McLean grew up in New York City and has been visiting the Metropolitan Museum since before he can remember, arguably even before he learned to play chess. Dylan McLean. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for all to you for coming here. Um, I will uh, try to talk about two elements of chess, uh, but which are kind of are at the intersection of the Lewis chessmen. The Lewis chessmen um, date from between about 1150 and 1200 A.D. from the Middle Ages. This was a time of, of important evolution in the game of, of chess. Lewis Chessmen are also, as you may have seen, or I hope you've seen the exhibition, they're fantastic uh, architectural specimens. They're, they're great works of art. And um, chess players, we spend most of our time when we're playing chess playing with fairly dull sets. <laughs> I've got a, an example of the, uh, in my speech, my speech here today. But um, at other times, you know, we get a ch chance to step back and appreciate them. And the wide range of things that people have done to create chess sets, the types of uh, experimentation, the materials, the wide range of imagination you'll see with some of the chess sets that I've pulled together for this exhibition, um, for my talk, excuse me. We'll start with the history of chess and the evolution of it. Uh, the game dates it back about 1,500 years. Um, it, it is thought to have uh, originated in India. Um, it was a game called, at the time, Chaturanga. It means literally, uh, four divisions, uh, four military divisions, it was based upon, as it says here in this slide, the infantry, who are today's pawns, cavalry, who are today's knights, elephants, we'll get to that in a second, and chariots, which are today's rooks. So in many ways, the game that was started 1,500 years ago, and we don't really know exactly why or how, um, is very similar to the game that's played today, with a couple of important differences. Um, the game spread initially uh, to Persia. This is a book from, uh, this is an illustration from the Book of Kings, was written about 1000 AD in uh, Persia. And what it depicts is actually how the game arrived in Persia, or at least it's a story about how it arrived in Persia. Supposedly, a Raja in India uh, sent a copy of the game to uh, the Persian um, royal, member of the royal, royal family and said, 
uh, to a Persian Shah, excuse me, and said, you know, without explaining the rules, here, is these, here are these uh, pieces, can you or your advisors figure out what this game is and what the rules are and how it's played? And uh, this being a Persian text, of course, they did that. <laughs> Uh, within a day or so, they came back and they explained the rules, and this is actually an illustration of one of the advisors to the Persian Shah's king explaining to the Indian envoy how the game works and being told, yes, you're right. The Persians then turned it around and uh, sent off a game to uh, the Indian Raja and said, can you explain how this game works? And it was basically the game of backgammon, um, and they failed. And as a result, the Indian Raja supposedly, according to the story, had to ship all kinds of jewels and gold to the Persian Shah. <laughs> Um, this is a map which explains more or less uh, chronologically and also geographically how the game spread. Uh, the number one is roughly where, uh, in the, India where, where the game was thought to have originated. Uh, by the seventh century within 100, it spread rather rapidly to Persia and then from Persia uh, through North Africa. The Arabs uh, conquered the Persians and they acculturated uh, the game and loved the game and they took it with them whenever, wherever they went and wherever they conquered. Uh, eventually, of course, they went into southern Europe through Spain, which became one of the centers for chess, for chess in Europe, and of course also through Italy. And then from there, the game spread north into northern Europe. So it took several hundred years, but uh, it got there. Um, when it's in its original form, um, the game had 32 pieces, and the important. This is a Persian set from the 12th century. Um, and what's important to, to note here are that there are a couple of pieces which are a little bit different, although you can't really tell because the, the design is very abstract. I think, is this, oh, that's right. Um, oh, I didn't mean to go forward. I meant to just click this, yes. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, oh, there it is. This thing is the, is the elephant. Uh, it's not, it's sitting in a position, if, for those who are familiar with chess today, which is now occupied by the bishop. And this is the Shah or king, and this, piece, which looks very similar to the Shagar king, is the vizier, the advisor to the, to the Shah or the king. They didn't have a queen at that point. This type of chess set or, um, persisted for hundreds of years after the introduction of the game. It persisted even in Europe at times when chess itself was changing. So there were, there were times when both types of chess, with, or both types of pieces coexisted together. Uh, this is a piece from... Um, I think it's the Metropolitan's uh, collection. This, of course, is a bishop. Um, what happened at some point, early in, after the came, um, went into Europe, uh, around 700, 800 AD, shortly after that, within 100 or 200 years, uh, bishops began to appear in place of elephants. <laughs> uh, the reason might have been that if you look at the elephants, they have these two protuberances, which sort of indicate the tusks. And it is possible that people looked at these and again, they did probably didn't know in Europe what elephants were. They certainly weren't a familiar element of their, uh, their everyday life. And they might have said, you know what, that looks a little bit like a bishop's mitre. And so that's one theory as to why they started to think about these things as bishops as opposed to elephants. Of course, another part, another theory has to do with the fact that the church was start establishing its power within Europe at this time. This is a time of incredible growth for the, from the, for the church in terms of its, uh, its prestige, its power. It was uh, trying to uh, show that, you know, it show it provide uh, its place in the hierarchy. And clearly, if you're setting up a hierarch hierarchical situation, you have the nexus of power, the, the very center of power, you have the king and the queen, the royalty, or whatever the royalty was. It wasn't a queen, necessarily but you have the king, and you want to be proximate to that, as close to that as possible. And the, bish the bishops, by replacing the elephants, end up being literally right next to the, the uh, king and the queen, or the, other, or the vizier, on the chessboard. This, by the way, this piece is from, uh, as it says, from Sicily. Again, this is an area that was under uh, the Moorish control um, in the early part of well, the Middle Ages. And they were still, this piece, it's thought to be actually an, an elephant, um, but it could, have, could be a bishop. It's not quite clear, of course, from the design. Uh, the other piece that changed markedly was the vizier became the queen. Um, there was, there was, there's a woman who, uh, named uh, Marilyn Yalom who wrote a book called Birth of the Chess Queen, which is a pretty good book in terms of research. A lot of this material I'm going to talk to you about is from that book. There were a lot of uh, very powerful queens who emerged in the early Middle Ages, um, particularly uh, the two here who were um, 
at the head of the Holy Roman Empire at, at various points, partly because of the deaths of their husbands. And as the game again evolved and as they took hold in Europe, other queens came to power um, in both in Spain um, and also in France, um, these also in uh, Scandinavia. And uh, again, this is the time when actually the game took on, Isabella was queen, it was the time when the game became, it's actually in, came into its modern form in a book that was written in Spain at the time. Uh, finally, Catherine the Great is an interesting story as well because in Russia, there was the last country really to adopt the chess queen, at least in Europe. It did it around the time that Catherine the Great became the, the uh, Russian Empress. So it's, it, it seems to play into the idea that at least it, it is plausible that the, the rise of the queens, whether it, it just convinced other people that you know, the queen should be on the board or maybe they actually had an influence on the people who were designing the sets. Of course, again, it also made sense. You know, if you're in, living in Europe, you don't know what a vizier is, but you do know what a queen is. There's, a, there's quite a few of those around at the time. Um, the first appearance of the queen in literature takes place in around 1000 AD, late, late 1990s. And again, if we go back a couple of slides, you see that these, these two, queen, two queens, these empresses, this is when they lived. So there was a monk who wrote a, a, an epic poem or large, uh, about chess, and in his poem, instead of a vizier, there's a queen. It seems to coincide very nicely with the time when they were, had taken, were heading the uh, Holy Roman Empire. One of the other interesting things, at least to me, is the development of the, the way the chess pieces are referred to. These are, in each case, these are the words, fierce and fierce, and fierce, and fierce are the words for uh, the queen in Persian or in Arabic. Feel is the word for bishop, or I'm sorry, for elephant, excuse me. Uh, and this, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the word for, for vizier, not queen. But as the game again developed, uh, it, it, you can see that some, there's an influence here. The, the game in, in, Spanish, in Spanish, the piece in, uh, for bishop is alfil, which comes directly from feel from the Persian. So this is a direct, and, and same thing in Italy. Again, if, keep in mind that both of these places were countries which were under Moorish control. Uh, in France, the, the, um, they referred initially to the piece which they started to call the queen as the fierce, which seems to come directly from fierce. And again, the same thing is true in Russian. So even these, are, these, are the words, these were the words that were used up until late Middle Ages. They then became known as dames. They, they, they changed from this initial uh, uh, use of this word, which clearly echoes what it was in Persian, to something different. And a part of it had to do with the elevation of the queen as a piece. Initially, the idea, was, the, the concern or the thought was that the pieces were, the queen was a sort of, a, well, first it was a weak piece, but also that um, the, the, the attitude towards women at the time was still undergoing some changes. As the queens took more control and more power, and as the, the, they also gained more respect on the chessboard, and, and we'll get also to what happened to them as pieces in terms of their powers, uh, they changed the names, the way they referred to them, and now, they became more elevated. Uh, this is a, uh, in, there was a very famous book written by this monk, Jacobus of de Sesulis, Sesulis? I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but anyway, it was about, about it was a collection of his sermons. He was a, a Dominican monk, he lived from about the, in 1260, 1270 to, to about 1320, and he wrote these sermons uh, on uh, where he used chess as basically a, a model for how people should live in society. This book, strangely enough, became, after the Bible, the most popular book in all of Europe. It was reprinted in many, many different languages, and when printing presses were invented some um, you know, a couple hundred years later, it was one of the first books that was widely printed and distributed around Europe. So chess had become so central to the, to the way people lived in Europe that he actually referred to it and used it as a model. And one of the things that's interesting to me, again, this is just maybe from a chess standpoint, standpoint is he, he actually distinguished, or tried to distinguish uh, the roles of the pawns and looking again at the hierarchy in, in chess, there was roles and responsibilities, I'm sorry, the hierarchy in society, the roles and responsibilities that people had, uh, he, he, he equated them as to what they did in, on the chessboard. So for each of the pawns, he came up with a descriptive for you know what, what type of, uh, I guess, person at the bottom of the, of the social structure they, they represented. And this set, which is from uh, early 18th century, we're going to get to the sets pretty soon. This is one of the reasons, again, I love chess. Uh, 
in, in fact, that I don't, aside from the fact that I love just to play it, uh, this chess set actually builds on his ideas. It actually uses as the basis for the figures that, it was, that, that were made from the set. This is, a, again, southern Germany, early 18th century. The thing which I really love, again, about looking at the set is that each one of these, these pawns represents Sicilius's ideas. So this, this set was made a couple hundred years after the book was even more widely distributed than it already had been. These are, the, of course, the white figures. And I mean, I love particularly this guy. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what he does, but it's uh, that they're, they're meant to represent each of the, each of the sort of the basic you know, roles and, and functions in society. The same thing with the black pieces as well. Um, as the queen worked its way throughout Europe, and it didn't happen all at once. I mean, there were some places that still used viziers, some places that used queens, but of course it became more prominent. And as the, the bishop also became more prominent, uh, there, were there were several things that happened in terms of the, the, the way the, rule, the game was played, the role of the game itself. Um, one of the things I noted here, I'm not gonna go into at great length, was that the game had started, some people had played the game using dice. It had been a gambling game, they had also used dice to actually determine which piece they should move. Uh, the pawns had also been somewhat more limited. As the game evolved in the Middle Ages, as it changed, as it was widely more, 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 more widely played and disseminated, they actually changed the, some of the rules. And this wasn't uniformly done. But the most important developments clearly were in the actual movement of the pieces. The, I've used queens here because I don't have a, a vizier. I'm not even sure what a vizier would look like. But, um, the original vizier was a very limited piece. It was a defensive piece. You could only move one square in either direction diagonally. And if you got a pawn down to the end of the board, it did promote, just like it does in today's game, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the rules, but then it would just become a vizier and it would just, it would just move one square again diagonally back. So it didn't have much of a, uh, didn't, couldn't do much. In the final form, in today's, today's chess, uh, and this is pretty much from the end of the 15th century, the queen is the most powerful piece on the board, which is a, an astonishing uh, you know, development. I mean, it's, it's, the queen can move now horizontally, vertically, and, and, and diagonally, and it, and it actually is the fiercest fierce piece on the board, which is maybe goes back to, the, again, the use of the word fierce, that they, uh, maybe this was an inspiration for how they would want to change the, the role of the queen. The elephants, again, I'm sorry, I had to use bishops, but um, the elephants were also a very defensive piece. They could only hop basically th one, from one square to th the third square in this direction or this direction. So if you look at it, you can actually count the elephants had a very limited number of squares they could even go to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I think there's an eighth uh, down here, right? So they, they, had, they were again a defensive piece. They didn't have much of a role. As the church, um, again, became more powerful in Europe, they began to take on a, this different role, which was uh, the one they have today, where they could r still go diagonally, but as many squares as they wanted to. And they became, a much, again, a much more important piece in terms of the game. The game also speeded up and became a more engaging game for people who wanted to play it. Um, the, the modern chess, in terms of the rules, really traces itself to the end of the 15th century. This was a book published, um, this, this is, most chess players, people who have played chess for many, many years are familiar with this name because there's actually a, a position in chess named after him. It's called the Lucina position. It refers to uh, how to s solve a particular endgame problem. He, he, book, he published this book in the end of the 15th, at the end of the 15th century, and the rules in this book, which include uh, the ones about uh, having the pawns be allowed to move two spaces as opposed to uh, just one, because they'd only been allowed to move one, this is pretty much the rules that we follow today. So somewhere along the lines, in those, in the, between the time that chess made it itself into, into, into Europe at the end of, well, let's say in the 700s or 800s, and the end of the 15th century, it changed to what we, the game that we now play today. And there hasn't been, there have been a couple of minor developments since, since then, one of them being uh, the rule of castling, but, and another one being a rule called en passant, but they're not as important as as the, the, the change in the, in the role and the function of the vizier slash bishop, I'm sorry, queen and the uh, elephant slash bishop. Now I'm gonna move on to the part of the, the lecture about chess sets as artwork. Um, I'm a chess player, as Barbara said, and I've played chess for many, many years, and uh, one of the great things about chess pieces is that they have weight and they have a feel, and it's, it's a tactile thing. I mean, you can see um, sometimes elite players, that when they 
when they capture a piece, they'll sit there and they'll spin it in their fingers and they're, you know, they're kind of juggling it. There's actually a guy who's going to play for the World Championship in two months and he takes the pieces and he clasps them in his hands underneath the table and he's constantly rolling them. We love, there's something that we love about handling chess pieces. And all the chess pieces that you're about to see in, in the collection, none of them are good for playing with, but they're great for probably handling and for looking at. Um, this is the standard chess set that we all use. This is, um, this was, this it's called the Staunton Design. It was named after a guy named Howard Staunton, who was the best chess player in the world. It was adopted um, as, it was, he, he gave it his imprimatur in 1851 to coincide with the first major international tournament. In 1924, the World Chess Federation adopted it as the st standard for all international matches and events. So everybody who plays chess plays with something that isn't something like this, not quite this nice a set. This is a, an ivory set, actually from the vintage of Howard Staunton's era. But they look very similar to this. Um, they're very effective, simple to recognize. This, of course, is the king. This is the queen, bishop, knight, rook, and pawn. They're easily identifiable, which is good when you're looking at a board and trying to puzzle out what your opponent's doing and what you want to do. Um, despite the fact that the uh, Islam, uh, sorry, the things change, the, the Islamic influence on chess sets, because they, uh, the first chess I showed you, showed you was from um, Persia, was abstract. That's con there's con a continuing influence from abstract design and from Islamic art. For reasons I'm not sure we completely agree on, the, uh, many of the chess sets that, uh, in, that were used in Islam were, not, were abstract, they were not figurative. There's, some people have said it's because they were not allowed to, you know, there, was, there were prohibitions against using figures, figures in, uh, in, in the Quran, but in some places in, uh, in Islam, in Islamic areas, they did have paintings and sculptures that were figurative. So this wouldn't necessarily have prevented them from using some other type of set, but they seem to dislike these. I find this very difficult to look at. And again, <laughs> I mean, you can sort of, like, you can clearly see what's a king and a queen, but if you look at the thing, all the shapes are very similar. This is another one, again, sort of similar to uh, another um, set. This one is from, uh, this is, I'm um, sorry, this is in India from the 17th century, and it's, you know, it, it's, I think if I was playing, using this as a chess set, I would, I would probably admire it from the standpoint of it's a beautiful set, but I wouldn't find it very practical. Many of the chess sets uh, revolve around, uh, to me, themes. I mean, of course, uh, chess is a game which is, in which two sides oppose each other, so it would lend itself to depictions of wars. And um, a lot of the sets that I looked at, and most of these sets, by the way, come from a, a fantastic book, a collection, um, a, a Detroit doctor named George Dean, who amassed this, this fantastic collection of chess sets over about 40 years. Most of these are drawn from his book called Chess Masterpieces, which uh, is a beautiful, beautiful book. I highly recommend it. This chess set is from 18th century France. It depicts the Punic Wars. Um, and it's made of ivory. Uh, one of the interesting things to me is that, uh, at least on one side, instead of bishops, they have boats. Um, they, they, one of the things that you start to get into as you get into these decorative and artistic sets is that they start to experiment with a form. You know, you don't have to stick to, well, there's a queen here or there's a bishop, you know, here or whatever. You can actually have some fun with it. And uh, I, I th also, what I also noticed is in some of these sets is that even though the elephant had sort of been drummed out of the game, it sometimes pops up again. Uh, this one happens to be on, under a rook, but in some cases they're even in the place of elephants. I'm sorry, in the place of bishops. So some places actually still go back to, to the older form. This set is, uh, the, depicts the Battle of Tobiak, which is about 500 AD. So it's also interesting the historical references that some of the set designers come up with. Uh, this is uh, also 18th century France. And I, I'm just, again, i struck by the fact, I guess, of the, the topic that they used. Um, this is a set depicting the, cruc the Third Crusade, which is from Denmark, uh, and it's porcelain uh, from about 1914. Uh, this, and then one of the very typical, a lot of the sets that I see or have seen um, get into the wars around Napoleon, uh, around the time of Napoleon, whether they're either French or because they're depicting his defeat. This, this set is from, uh, early 19th century France, and uh, the, the king is Napoleon, the queen is Josephine, and over here we have King George and Queen Charlotte. So uh, you'll see this happen again. This is a better look at this, some of these figures. What I also find I love about these figures is that they're so detailed. A, you can actually tell who these people are. It's not really hard to, uh, to figure out. 
This is another of uh, one of these sets from the same, depicting, again, sort of same era. This is the War of 1812. Um, it's, uh, this is a ceramic set. It's um, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, this, I'm, this is not that. This is something else. This is an earlier set. Uh, I've gotten my information confused, but it's, I know it's uh, King George, I think it was. And, uh, well, we'll go keep going. This is another one, Napoleonic set, obviously. And this, what's interesting here, again, is there's this, because it's a f decorative set and it's not necessarily function meant to be functional, the queen is uh, clearly not <laughs> a queen. <laughs> it's one of his top generals. I think it's actually, it's, uh, it's uh, Jacques Mouret, and then on the other side, um, we have, this is actually a set uh, uh, having to do with um, his, his conflict with, with Russia. This is uh, Tsar Alexander I, and his queen is General, General Kutzo, Kutzo Tuzov. So, um, and this is in the sort of the same form. This is obviously a revolutionary, I'm sorry, a Civil War set. We have, again, Abraham Lincoln, and his queen is Ulysses S. Grant, and uh, Jefferson Davis and uh, Robert E. Lee is his queen. Uh, World War I, um, and uh, what I love, again, is, is, there's, these are, there's a lot of range of things you can do with these chess, types of chess sets. Um, I think one of these is, I forget, I think one of them was Mussolini, but I'm not quite sure. No, it's not Mussolini, I'm sorry, it's the, this is the uh, World War I. There's a different set which we'll get to, which has got Mussolini in it. But the, what, I, what it's amazing to me about this is, again, how expressive they can be with the, what they're doing. They don't have to stick to figures as well. Um, this set is, uh, has to do with the Italian War, and I th it's, it is uh, Franz, this is, a, this is Franz Joseph, I believe, and Empress Elizabeth, and this is uh, Napoleon III and Empress Eugenia. Uh, this is the set I was mentioning earlier. This is Mussolini, this is the, uh, the Ethiopian War and, uh, from the early 20th century. This, this set's from the 1930s. And it's, I think, out of porcelain. I'm sorry, it's ivory, excuse me. Oh, this, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this, this, uh, this actually, uh, I think Dr. Dean actually had made, but this is, uh, I said obviously about World War II. Uh, we have here uh, Hitler and Eva Braun, Emperor Hirohito. This is Mussolini, FDR. Um, this is uh, Stalin, of course, this is Churchill. They're obviously very stylized, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I'm not sure, again, I could use this set in the game, but it certainly would be fun to try. <laughs> um, they're also, again, because of this sort of the, the, uh, the way that chess lends itself to sort of a, a, a dialogue or a conflict between two things, it's often used for social and political commentary. This is a set from uh, 1923, I believe, or so it's early, early part of the 20th century. It depicts um, elements of the, I'm sorry, mid 20th century, I guess. It depicts elements of the Cold War. Here we have uh, capitalism on one side. We have death holding a femur. We have uh, enchained workers. Um, and then, of course, the good guys are the communists. And we have a, a worker and uh, a, a, a obviously looking very regal and uh, a good person. The, the worker is now not in chains. So, um, this is another, on the same theme, this is a propaganda set. Uh, we have, again, we have uh, communist workers or, or socialist workers uh, against the capitalist pigs. Or, you know, the, uh, the exemplified by the, the king is here is a capitalist with, uh, I think, a, and the uh, queen has a fur, and the workers on the, uh, on the communist side are obviously, they're, they're dressed sort of shabbily, but they're, uh, they're, they're noble people. They're, they have a different type of bearing to them. They're also, of course, larger figures to suggest, I guess, that they're better people. Uh, another wonderful set. Um, this one is terracotta, actually. And that's another thing, this, this, the materials that are used, the range is astonishing. This is a, a Vietnam War set, Vietnam era war set. Uh, we have on this side the doves, Martin Luther King, Joan Baez, uh, this is a RFK. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I, know, if I remember everybody else. And on the Hawks side, we have uh, LBJ. Um, there's R Ronald Reagan, gov of course, governor at the time of California. Uh, Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, Dean Rusk. Um, you can have a lot of fun with this sort of stuff. Another, another one that lends itself to natural use is good versus evil. This is the evil side. I happen to like them better. <laughs> 
but you can see the, how, how they contrast with the, uh, with the good side. This is actually Florence, 18th century, and uh, ivory, ivory and ebony, another fun one. This is virtue versus uh, vice, 19th century. Um, again, I, I like the fact that they put, uh, this is vice in the, in the front, in case you couldn't tell. The king has a, uh, a, is, a, is, is holding a cup of drink, and he's got a, r a ruddy nose, and so does the bishop. <laughs> Ah, and this is another great one. Um, in, in terms of the idea of contrasts, uh, this is uh, 1835. Well, it's, it's, it's about 200 years old. It's porcelain, Berlin, Germany. And it's, take your choice, blondes or brunettes. <laughs> uh, obviously, again, they're, they're, I think chess sets are great works of art. Um, this, this is a fascinating story behind this. This is Fabergé. Uh, Dr. Dean acquired this set. Um, uh, some years ago, it, I'm not going to go into the whole history of it, but it's it's he knew this ex had existed, and uh, and, it came, and by chance he happened to come upon it at a time when somebody had just displayed it, and he basically haggled them into agreeing to let him uh, buy the set. It's uh, silver and it's uh, I'm trying to remember the other materials, but it's a um, it's uh, there's a, there's enamel, there's a, and it's, it's handmade. It's a beautiful thing. You can see the inscription down here from 1904, 1905. What he didn't know when he acquired the first set, and that's part of the reason why he, how he happened to acquire the set, was there was a second set that Fabergé had made some 10 years later. And this, again, echoing this theme, theme of war, these are the, uh, this is uh, Egyptians versus the Assyrians. So this was an, it's a very different style in, than the uh, first one, but, but Fabergé nonetheless. This is a set commissioned by Catherine the Great, entirely of amber. Um, and she, what she did was she had herself cast as the queen. Her king is not the king, but her lover, Potemkin. Uh, this is her son, and this is his wife, so as the, as the opposing king and queen. Of course, she has to be the biggest figure. <laughs> this is a porcelain set. Again, we start to see um, there's a wide range of materials. This is a 17th century porcelain set. I forget from which country offhand, but, but these, these sets are... I, to, to me, again, uh, even though they're not very practical, I think of them as extraordinary. This is Jasper Ware, uh, which is, I think, King George III. This is uh, from Venice, or from Murano, actually. I guess it's Murano glass ware. Um, this is another type of, this is a crystal set. It's actually contemporary, but it's, uh, uh, it just, again, shows a wide range. I love this set. This is a Chinese set. Um, I think the 19th or 18th, 18th century. I mean, it's 18th century, I believe. And uh, it's ivory, of course. Um, it's extraordinary detail uh, on this set. Uh, when, I, we, when I look into the, zoom in, you can see how the figures are carved. There's an, an amazing amount of workmanship in this. Even the shields themselves are expressive. And in the base of the figures, you see these inc incredibly elaborate scenes. Um, it just, it gives, at least for me, it gives me a whole, whole different appreciation for, for what you can do with these things. The, even the boards can be decorative and uh, quite elaborate. This is the obverse of that board, which is from the 17th century. Uh, another board I just thought was absolutely beautiful. I mean, the chess set itself is pretty nice, but the, the board is extraordinary. Um, and of course, the materials. Again, as I mentioned this, this is a rock crystal uh, with silver gilt. Uh, and this is from the 17th century. This is tortoise shell used as, as for the material for the pieces. Uh, coral. This is uranium glass. Amber again. And of course, you can carve rather wonderful details into this. Uh, this is a set which depicts Africans versus, and I think it's, uh, I know it's Europeans, but that's right, Europeans and, and Africans. It's made of a combination of coral, marble, I, uh, and ebony. This is a set from uh, uh, Java. It's made of bamboo. And again, it's expressed, It's amazing the figures, the expression, expressions of the figures. There's the elephant appearing again, because it's an Easter. This is a, uh, from Morocco, mid 19th century. It's entirely out of silk. It's a traveling set. And then, of course, if you can go over the top if you want to. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Then you have the other end of the spectrum, or not the other end of the spectrum, but I mean, these are rather elaborate, ornate uh, sets. These are, of course, precious jewels, silver, gilded silver. This is a Rococo set from the mid-17th mid century, I believe. 
semi-precious stones, uh, silver and enamel with, with precious stones uh, from I think the mid 18th, no, this is the uh, early 20th century. Um, beautiful enamel, and this is a Baroque set. And uh, the attention to detail, and again, the, 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 all the stones they've used to decorate these figures. Even the coats of arms are all different and very elaborate. Uh, one of the other things that's important about some of these sets, and this is, I, this is a piece again from the Metropolitan's uh, own collection, is that they sometimes uh, told you something about the way people actually dressed in the particular era. This is a chess set, chess piece, or obviously a knight, but uh, I'm, I'm told, I understand that this is one of the only examples of, of actually, it actually shows what horse armor was like back in the Middle Ages, a complete set of horse armor. Uh, this is a set that uh, which I liked, again, just because it's, uh, the costuming is, is fantastic. What I particularly like were the jesters, which seem to be actually, and this is a 17th century set. It's, of course, it's not contemporary, but they, they uh, obviously have taken some time to recreate the period costumes. Same thing with this. This is in the Battle of Jarnak. So it's a set commemorating that. Um, this is a set which, uh, looking at the British and Chinese wars, in the, and this is actually from the 19th century, or conflicts. I'm sorry, this is not the, that's not that set. This is different than the Zibuchler set, which is, that's the one from the Chinese and British conflict. I'm going to go through a, a bit of these now. There's a, a, all kinds of, of uh, subjects matters. I mean, it's pretty much, you can stretch your imagination in any way you want. Insects, sea creatures, and even tulips. Um, Duchamp was a, a very passionate chess player. In fact, he basically gave up chess. I'm sorry, gave up being an artist to be a chess player. Now, these, these quotes of his sort of, I think, sum up to some degree why he did this. Uh, particularly, I've, I've sort of memorized this one. So when everybody, somebody says, well, what are you doing playing chess all the time? Well, <laughs> to me, this is the answer. Um, in the mid-1940s, he, uh, along with Julian Levy, organized a landmark exhibition at Julian Levy's gallery and uh, they invited some of the top artists of the day to design chess sets, some of whom were already passionate players. This is a picture from the exhibition. This is Duchamp with his back to the camera making moves against uh, several people who were actually playing this man, who was a famous grandmaster named George Koltanowski. He was playing them blindfold. He was announcing the moves out loud. Uh, this, this set here that's being used by Shawinski is a Bauhaus set. And again, I find this, and this is by Joseph Hurt, uh, Hurt, Hartwig, and I find this absolutely impossible to use, but certainly interesting in terms of the reimagining of the shapes of the chess pieces. This was Max Ernst's contribution to the, to the uh, exhibition. And what's interesting to me, again, is they didn't, this is not just a one-off for him. He used it in a sculpture he did 10 years later. You can see some of the pieces, and of course, even the subject again. So the artists incorporated this into their work, at least some of them. This is Man Ray's contribution to the exhibition. And uh, this is Isamu Noguchi. By the way, a lot of these images we're looking at are from Noguchi's uh, museum because they actually did a retrospective of the exhi exhibition back in 2005 on the, uh, I guess, 60th anniversary. These were pieces designed by Noguchi along with the table to go with the set. And Andre Breton <laughs> had to put his two cents in, I guess. <laughs> I like this one personally. <laughs> This was not part of the exhibition, but I love it. Salvador Del Dali, he just made his own fingers. <laughs> and this is a remarkable. Uh, as part of the, the exhibition, uh, they invited a couple of composers to also uh, contribute, and John Cage composed an entire musical score in the form of a chessboard. I haven't... Finally, um, I'm going to uh, about wrap things up, but chess sets continue. I mean, these, everything I've been showing is historical except for this chess set, which actually is uh, Yeruda. It comes from, it's from Nigeria. A friend of mine uh, was in Nigeria a couple months ago and bought this on the street. And uh, it's just, again, it to me is phenomenal that there's so much energy and effort uh, going into this. It's the materials are, uh, it's light thorn wood, um, which I guess is easy for carving and probably cheap material. But um, there, I wish I had some more contemporary stuff. There was, there's some chess sets I saw that are, uh, again, extraordinary in terms of the, the creativity that some of these people use, whether they're artists or otherwise, uh, to display and talk about the chess sets. I, I saw actually a chess set that had, was entirely of women versus a chess set that was entirely of men. You can pretty much do whatever you want. 
Um, it, it's not, it, I, I think people probably think that chess sets because you know you have to have 32 pieces, you have to have a board, it constrains you, but clearly there's a lot of different ways that uh, people can go, a lot of different directions. I think my time is about up, so I'm gonna stop. Anyway, thank you. Dylan had to uh, excuse himself immediately after his lecture to go to work at the New York Times. Um, last night I happened to be watching Casablanca with my children who hadn't seen it before and I noticed that Humphrey Bogart plays against himself uh, a game of chess during the, uh, at his Rick's Café Américain and he's using a Staunton set. I guess they didn't have that Hitler versus FDR set yet. <laughs> Our next speaker is James Robinson. James Robinson is senior curator of the late medieval collections at the British Museum, where he has responsibility for more than 10,000 objects. Mr. Robinson is an expert on medieval jewelry and seals and was curator of the exhibition Good Impressions, Image and Authority on Medieval Seals. In 2009, he assumed responsibility for devising and then delivering the Paul and Jill Ruddock Gallery of Medieval Europe, 1050 to 1500, the opening of which was accompanied by his book, Masterpieces, Medieval Art. Most recently, James was one of the four curators responsible for the exhibition Treasures of Heaven, which was seen in London, Cleveland, and Baltimore, and to which I'm proud to say the Metropolitan lend a number of its reliquaries, including the poster girl for the London venue, a beguiling re reliquary of a companion of St. Ursula, which you can also see at the cloisters. In 2004, James wrote a short monograph on the Lewis Chessman, the subject of his lecture today. That book, which is, by the way, available in our bookstore, is now in its fifth reprint, and it is the highest selling of the British Museum's object and focus publications. I will sorely miss the Lewis Chessmen when they return to London at the end of April, but I will be especially sad to, de to be deprived of the happy collaboration this project has afforded with my colleague James Robinson. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Barbara, for that very kind introduction. And uh, I can only concur that this has been one of my happiest collaborations, too. And I'll be very sorry to see the Lewis Chessmen, um, in, a, in a sense, leave the splendors of this Romanesque hall where they're currently shown. And I, I would urge you, if you've not seen the exhibition, you know, fast track up there to, um, to get a glimpse of them as they might once have been seen in the Middle Ages. I mean, there isn't another exhibition space, really, that can give you that vista. On, a, on the sort of setting, the sorts of objects that might have surrounded the Lewis Chessmen back in the 12th century. Um, <clears throat> got to change eyes, I'm afraid, otherwise we'll, we'll get confused. Um, um, for those of you who missed um, Barbara's opening um, comments, I, I'll just um, repeat a little bit of what she said. Um, at the cloisters at the moment, we have 34 chess pieces plus a beautifully engraved belt buckle all of them are carved from the tusks of the walrus um, in the second half of the 12th century, somewhere in Scandinavia, probably Norway. Um, and I'll just provide a few more background details. The chessmen comprise part of a horde of 93 walrus ivory objects found at some point before um, April 1831 on the Isle of Lewis, um, from which they take their name, in the Outer Hebrides off the western coast of Scotland. The belt buckle and 14 ivory counters, probably used in a game similar to backgammon, were found with them. Most of the hoard was acquired by the British Museum between November 1831 and January 1832, um, but 11 further pieces turned up, unknown to the British Museum, their existence was unknown to the British Museum. They turned up and were acquired um, ultimately by the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh in 1888. They are now generally, probably generally regarded now as the most famous chessmen in the world. And what I'd like to explore today um, is a single facet of their character, but one that indisputably underpins their appeal to a modern audience. From the moment of their discovery, they were considered to be curiosities, 
Colloquial, account, colloquial accounts of the find describe a peasant stumbling upon them in a sand dune in Uig Bay, who, seeing an assemblage of elves or gnomes, fled in terror at what he believed to be the pygmy sprites of Celtic folklore. His bolder wife forced him to, to return and to scoop them up. Now, there's no evidence that this was the actual sequence of events, and the earliest documented description of their discovery that includes mention of the fearful peasant dates from 20 years afterwards. The story was related by Daniel Wilson in 1851 and was published in his survey of the archaeology and prehistoric annals of Scotland. The human qualities of the chessmen, they are and have been considered to be, as Wilson's account demonstrates, little people, combined with their universal understanding of the game of chess, conspire to make them the most popular touring exhibits of all of the British Museum's treasures. And although the Cloisters is uniquely privileged to show more than a previous, previously been lent overseas, um, smaller delegations of the chessmen have traveled to Canada, Australia, India, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, France, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Italy, and Spain. And that's just to name the ones that I can remember. So they're really probably more well-traveled than any of us here in this room. Um, so what is the essence of their enduring global appeal? Most modern audiences find it impossible to look upon them without smiling. Many commentators feel that they constitute rare examples of that elusive human impulse, humor. So this afternoon, I'm posing the question, how comic are the Lewis Chessmen? So to explain my opening slide, um, <clears throat> this illustration of Homer Simpson as a Lewis chess king, beautifully drawn by the British Museum's illustrator, Craig Williams, was inspired by a review of the Game of Kings in the New York Times by Ken Johnson, and that was published on the 17th of November last year. He likened the bug-eyed chessmen to the Simpsons in the following passage. If by some typically improbable turn of events, Homer Simpson were to unearth from his backyard an old chess containing a chess set from, the, from medieval times, what would the pieces look like? Chances are they would resemble the lovable little contestants beautifully carved from walrus tusks by anonymous artisans in the famous cache known as the Lewis Chessmen. He goes on to say, Except for the pawns, which are shaped like tombstones and domed, topped octagonal towers, each king, queen, bishop, knight, and warder, as rooks used to be called, has the bug-eyed, stupefied expression of a Simpson. They could be Homer's ancestors. So I'm showing this slide really as a way of demonstrating that our view of historic artifacts and our points of reference to them is inevitably colored by our own more recent experiences. Occasionally, these observations may lead, may lead us to a better understanding of the past by underlining that not much has changed, that our ancestors were governed by the same instincts that make us laugh, play, cry, and grieve today. But how do we interpret a juxtaposition such as this? Craig's reworking of Homer Simpson was modeled on the Lewis Chess King, shown on the right. And you can see the obvious similarities in the protuberant eyes, um, the um, overbite of the top lip, and a generally linear rendering of facial details. But does this necessarily imply that figures rendered in this way were always perceived as comic? What it may mean, oddly, is that the graphic artists responsible for The Simpsons have imbibed rather more than they might realize from the world of the 12th century in terms of a certain economy of expression. The two products, however, have probably strung from very different intentions. That the chessmen exercise a mysterious but more conscious charm over modern audiences is clearly shown by the manga publication of Oshino Yukinobu, um, Professor Munakata's British Museum adventure. The original artwork um, shown here is the subject of a beautifully conceived and a very fun exhibition at the British Museum curated by my friend and colleague, Nicole Rumanière. Um, and in fact, you can see, if I can make the pointer, do this the trick. There's a portrait of Nicole in the foreground, and there's me helping the police with their inquiries in the background. <clears throat> the chessmen were not only pivotal in the plot, appearing throughout as clues to a dastardly plan to rob the museum, but they were positively instrumental in persuading Hoshino Yokinobu to embark on this collaboration. 
he was, like all of us, completely beguiled by them. Now, the next slide is a bit of an aside, but this is to return to my general point about exercising caution in how we interpret historic material. I couldn't resist showing this illustration from a satirical song sheet. Um, it's from about 1801, entitled Taking an Airing in Brighton. The song, um, the text at the bottom of the image, is lampooning the fashion for young ladies to cultivate an affection for exotic pets. The donkey was, apparently, the animal favoured by the beau monde in 1801. Now, although the words of the song are gently humorous in outlining the social folly, it's the speech bubble that usually prompts the biggest laugh from a modern audience. The young lady exclaims to her servant, whip my ass, John, whip it well. Now, this, ex this exclamation is unlikely to have had the same resonance for an early 19th century English audience as it does for anyone today. The cute factor of the Lewis chessmen, quite understandably, provokes a strong interest from children. <clears throat> Here, young Juliet is handling a bishop, I think. Um, and in fact, although the, diminu the diminutive proportions of the chessmen um, and their toy-like qualities exercise undeniable power over a young audience, as Juliet's T-shirt illustrates, um, it was their cameo appearance in the first Harry Potter movie, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, that secured for them a new worldwide fan base. Here, <coughs> Harry and Ron pit their wits against one another in a game of wizard's chess. The scene in the film featured a facsimile Lewis chess set owned by my colleague Irving Finkel from the British Museum's Middle East Department. And this following clip from the film is shown by kind permission of Warner Brothers. Knight to E5. Queen to E5. That's totally barbaric. That's wizard's chess. Well, you get the idea. Um, I mean, it is an absolutely captivating um, uh, feature of the film. It's, it's brilliant. And, and the relevance of the scene is that it relies for its comic power on an emotional response to the queen's appearance. The Lewis chess queens, with their chins resting in their hands, are most usually viewed as grumpy, um, bored, perhaps suffering from toothache. But how correct is this interpretation? I'd like to share with you one further modern take on the chess men before I look a little more closely at them as 12th century creations. This particular piece has a very special place in my affections. It represents an infantry man, a foot soldier, which within the context of the Lewis chess pieces takes the place of the modern rook. He's very special because of all the chess men, he's the only one not to have a fully frontal stance. As you can see, he's turning slightly to one side. This endows him with a vulnerability that the other pieces don't have. It suggests a certain hesitancy, perhaps even a desire to be elsewhere. This emotional dimension was observed by two British animation filmmakers in the 1950s, Peter Furman and Oliver Postgate. They christened this particular chessman Noggin and built around him uh, the BBC TV series Noggin the Nog, which was broadcast in Britain for around 40 years. Now, again, with kind permission um, from um, the Furman and Postgate estate, um, the following film clip documents how the chessmen were perceived um, by these artists. of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. In the dark night that is very long, the men of the Northlands sit by the great log fires and they tell a tale. They tell how a prince built a long ship and sailed in it beyond the black ice at the edge of the world to bring home his bride from the land of the midnight sun. 
Noggin the Nog was the name of the prince, young and strong and fair as the men of the Northlands are. And he was the son of Knut, king of the Nogs, the ruler of this land of dark forest and snow. This land of mountains and valleys, of deep narrow bays where the sea roars between the black rocks and the wind howls cold in the night. There was the little town of wooden houses, clustered by a bay where the sea was calm. And there above it was the small castle, the castle of King Knut. Now every morning as the sun rose, King Knut put on his crown and took his morning walk. Up the steep path beside his castle to the rock above the town, the rock which was known as Knut's seat. There he sat, and as the sun rose behind the mountains to melt away the black clouds of night, King Knut would begin to worry. He would look down on the harbour and the little wooden houses, and he would worry about his people, and what they would eat in winter, and whether their roofs leaked, and whether they had warm socks this cold weather. He would look down on his castle and worry about his queen, Gunhilda, and who would look after her when he died, for he was a very old king and not at all well. And then he would think of his son, Noggin, and he would worry about Noggin, because it was the custom in the Northland that the king should be married. And if Noggin had not chosen a maiden to be his queen within six weeks of his father's death, then he could not be king. Well, I have to say I'm extremely grateful to Steve and the audiovisual unit for um, managing to get that clip embedded into the uh, presentation today because my mission would not have been complete if I hadn't exposed an American audience to the joys of Nog in the Nog. Um, and, uh, and you can see exactly um, what the appeal of this is and, and, and really how these um, brilliant filmmakers engaged with the Lewis Chessmen. Um, now, I think that that clip was, was wonderfully redolent of the Norse world, in a sense, because it almost participates in the ancient tradition of oral storytelling um, that they describe. And the inspiration of the artwork provided by the chessmen is clear as this slide demonstrates. It shows Peter Furman's drawing of Knut, placed alongside the heavily bearded chess um, king from the Lewis Horde. Um, and this is um, as telling as with the Harry Potter episode that features the angry queen, that the king is portrayed in the film as being anxious. I love the line where he's anxious about whether they've got warm socks to wear in the winter, you know. So, um, so this, uh, somehow this anxiety is being transferred onto these little pieces. Um, now, I've, in I've included the next um, slide to make the same point explicitly in relation to Noggin. You can clearly see the connection between the original chessman um, and the characters visualized by Peter Furman. Note particularly the similarity around the head and the way that he glances that Noggin glances slightly to the right. I mean, it's just delightful. That's, um, but it's true that Noggin is given a rather more carefree expression. Um, <clears throat> and just to be clear, um, I'm as likely to indulge in the impulse to have a laugh with the chessman as anyone else is. Um, and here is a slide of one of my favorite dialogues between two pieces. Um, and in fact, Barbara and I, I have to admit, had a great deal of fun positioning them um, in November when we were installing the exhibition because it's irresistible not to team them up. Um, so look how uncomfortable poor old Noggin, oops, sorry, whoops, wrong one, poor old Noggin is. Um, when placed next to the character on the left who um, is gnawing at the top of his shield. Both pieces take the position of rooks in the Lewis sets and were not designed necessarily to be seen together but they make such a great double act. Um, and the character biting the top of his shield appears to be an even more deliberate masterpiece of the comic with his great big bulging eyes and his prominent teeth that might be chattering in fear. Indeed, when it comes to provoking a smile, the warders, that is the rooks, may just win the prize as these five amply illustrate. The two top pieces are conventional foot soldiers and are suitably equipped for battle with sword, shield, and protective headgear. Although it's true to say the one on the right seems to be wearing a bowler hat, and the one on the left something resembling a lampshade. Um, but in fact, both do conform to the military dress of the period and are probably not intended as caricatures. Part of what makes them comic to a modern observer is that they lack feet or necks. You see, all of them are on these flat bases 
and there's no um, evidence of any neck that connects them, the head to the shoulders. Um, <clears throat> and this means that they all appear squat and rather hunched. In fact, all of the chessmen are expertly carved, and it was interesting to hear Dylan's remarks about the um, tactile qualities of pieces and the sort of practicalities of playing with certain pieces, because each of these are carved with considerable, considerable regard for their function as game pieces. Each of the warders show how every individual part of the carving is contained within the frame of the figure to prevent it from damage. There are no protuberant points, and the weak point that might be provided by the neck um, is completely avoided. And it's worth noting that some later chess pieces, where they have given the sort of the pieces have got more elegance because they're given the benefit of a neck, they've lost their heads because it's a real, um, it's a very vulnerable point of breakage. But what about these um, shield biters on the bottom row? Surely we're allowed to laugh at those. Um, well, maybe not, because these three individuals are possibly the most significant of all the pieces, because these are the ones that fix the Lewis Chessmen firmly within Norse culture. Although irresistibly comic to us, these little characters are almost certainly intended to, to represent fierce fighting machines. The teeth that appear to chatter in terror are an unmistakable sign that these soldiers are a specific type of warrior, the berserker. Snorri Sturluson refers to the berserkers in his saga, The Heimskringler, written in around 1230. Sturluson is writing within a Christianized society where the recent pagan past is still celebrated as a golden age of valor. He describes berserkers in the following way. The soldiers of Odin went forth to the combat without armor, raging like dogs or wolves, biting their shields, and in strength equal to furious bulls or bears. Their enemies lay prostrate at their feet, neither fire nor weapons harmed them. This frenzy was known as berserk's genger. So not to be trifled with, that's the message there. Now, the starring role given to the queens in the Harry Potter wizard's chess sequence reflects the great popularity of the queens among the Lewis chessmen. This, as I remarked earlier, is directly related to the fact that they look so utterly fed up. <laughs> Here, all five of the British Museum queens um, are uh, in a display of apparently unambiguous grumpiness. Each supports her chin in her hand in a manner that is almost universally interpreted by the mass of onlookers to convey boredom. Two have objects in their left hands, one illustrated top right um, holds a horn, and another, bottom left, holds a length of a cloth or a veil. It's uncertain what the significance of these items might have been. The horn resembles the type of horn that operated a little like a bugle to sound an alarm in the defense of city walls or for use in hunting. It might equally be intended to represent a drinking horn. Snorri Sturluson's epic poem, Edda, makes reference to a horn used by a queen for the storage of money. Each of these interpretations could be equally correct. The military function of a horn to sound an alarm is entirely appropriate on the, on the battlefield, and as Dylan demonstrated, this is exactly what the chessboard sets out. Chess is, after all, essentially a war game. Um, Dylan already mentioned the, how chess was devised in the 6th century when the, where the pieces um, represented the four orders of the Indian army. And as chess passed through the routes that Dylan explained through Persia, the Islamic territories before arriving in Europe um, from around the late 10th century, it evolved and absorbed different influences. The queen is part of the Christianization of the game and does not appear in either the Indian or the Islamic versions of chess. Um, I've also cited here Marilyn Nilom's work. Marilyn's at Stanford University um, and, and um, published her book, The Birth of the Chess Queen, in 2004, where she sets out comprehensively the development of the queen in chess. <clears throat> um, she relates, and, and I think this is um, perfectly convincing, as, as Dylan also suggested, that the introduction of the, of the queen to the game reflects the political power that the medieval queen wielded. A queen, as Henry II of England's queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine, proved in the 1170s, could mobilize military forces even in opposition to her own king. So what can we deduce from the Lewis Chess Queen's characteristic pose? Is she disgruntled with her king? Is that why he, in turn, looks so worried? 
I think the clue to the Lewis Chess Queen's pose lies with another more celebrated queen, the Virgin Mary, Queen of Heaven. The cast bronze figure on the right is a representation of the Virgin from a crucifixion group. It dates from the late 11th or early 12th century and would have been positioned at the foot of the cross with a figure of St. John. In this context, the pose adopted by the Lewis Chess Queens would appear to express sorrow. The cult of the Virgin Mary blossomed in the 12th century and had a huge impact as an exemplar for medieval queenship. The adoption of a pose associated with the grieving virgin is almost certainly intended to convey compassion as the Lewis Queens mourn for their fallen troops. This detail shows not just the identical nature of the pose, but the very close similarities in modeling. Both figures conform to the stylistic conventions represented by the Romanesque period. The term Romanesque was devised in the early 19th century as a way of defining um, Western European art artistic activity from about the middle of the 11th century to around the early years of the 13th. The period is also known as the 12th century Renaissance to express the notion that such a phenomenal growth of ideas had not occurred since the times of ancient Rome. Apart from minor variations in dress, beard, hair, or stance, all of the Lewis chessmen have the same facial features, prominent staring eyes, downturned mouths, and slightly protuberant upper lips. This homogeneity was quite usual in a period that did not think in terms of individual portraiture. The portrait really is um, an innovation of the 1300s. The backs of the seated figures' thrones display a much greater wealth of individual treatment, as is shown by this slide of the reverse of the queens. This exuberant decoration with grotesques amid fleshy tendrils are in keeping with the stylistic preoccup preoccupations of the age. They operate rather like the drawings in the margins of medieval manuscripts, uh, which, however, do contain comic elements. But in the case of the Lewis Chessmen, there is no evidence that the carvings were designed to do anything more than, than to entertain the eye during what might be a very lengthy game. And as Dylan demonstrated in his um, uh, presentation of, the develop of how chess evolved, um, early chess theorists tried to, contact diff tried to concoct different ways of speeding chess up because some, some games would go on for just too long, I mean, for days and days and days as they do today, of course. Um, and this included the introduction of dice and the developments in the different moves, um, such as for the queen and the bishop. So at the risk of becoming predictable in my argument, let's turn to the Homeric kings. Um, the kings are all seated on thrones as ornate and individualized as those of their queens. Each grips a sword with both hands and rests it across his knees. The sword suggests conventional physical strength, but also implies the administration of unswerving justice. The portrayal of the king ruling wisely and exacting justice with a firm hand had a very long literary pedigree. As with the medieval, queen, reliance, uh, as, as with the medieval queen's reliance on the Virgin Mary, the Christian exemplar for medieval kingship was provided by Christ himself as king of heaven. Medieval monarchy was not a laughing matter, literally. This description of Louis the Pious by Tegan, Bishop of Trier, in 836, gives possibly a rather extreme view on what was considered appropriate behavior in a king. He never raised his voice in laughter, not even at the height of the festivities when, to the joy of the people, actors, jesters, and mimes with flutes and sitars appeared before him. Not even as the people in his presence laughed with measure, he never even allowed his white teeth to be bared in laughter. This passage is probably more revealing uh, about the church's doctrinal view of laughter than about the reality, of course. Laughing with measure was acceptable, but a lack of control was seen to lead to hidden dangers. The monastic rule of, of Benedict condemned laughter as incompatible with prayer, and saw it as an, as an impediment to empathy with the suffering of Christ. And it was also noted by a number of scriptural theorists that the Gospels never describe Christ as breaking into a laugh. We can't deduce from this, of course, that laughter was banished from medieval society. The minstrels and jesters at the festivities enjoyed by Louis the Pious, or not enjoyed as much as he might, show that humor was indulged in. 
Indeed, by the 12th century, the period when the chessmen were carved, a satiric wit that could be directed against the king himself and his court had developed. This was owing mainly to the interest in the, classical, uh, in, in the classics that flourished as part of the 12th century Renaissance, as writers used formal models inherited from the texts of Horace, Persis, and Juvenal. The satires that were produced were written in Latin and were composed for a learned audience. The authors were churchmen and were principally concerned with abuses in the church. However, a number turned their critical gaze on the rest of society, from the king downwards. Nigel of Canterbury's Mirror of Fools, written in about 1180, depicts the bad king as fickle, tyrannical, and a robber rather than a ruler. These stock complaints against the unjust king vary very little in the detail. The Lewis chess kings from the model set out by church theorists and satirists alike would, however, appear to embody the values of the virtuous monarch. Bishops come in for rather more extensive criticism from 12th century satirists, as the worldly excesses of the church were their primary target. Bishops are caricatured for neglecting their spiritual duties, preferring to live in luxury. They were characterized by the vices of sloth, gluttony, and lust, and were criticized for their love of hunting. Bernard de Morval's De Contempt De Contemptu Mundi, written a little before the middle of the 12th century, describes the typical bishop in the following way. The upright bishop goes out for hares, goes hawking, the leash is removed, the wild beast sought and roused, a sleek horse adds to the splendor of his elegance. Now the loose chessmen bishops show no visible signs of these worldly excesses. They stand or are seated on thrones, and are furnished with croziers and occasionally Bibles. They are rather somber and pious looking, but this is entirely in keeping with the spiritual values that they are meant to personify. Like the queen, the bishop is introduced as part of the Christianization of the game, but emerges only in the 12th century. It has been suggested that their very appearance on the board is a satirical jibe against the worldly excesses of bishops, since the clergy were explicitly forbidden to play chess. The prominent church reformer, Peter Damien, describes his dismay in 1061-62 when he discovered that the Bishop of Florence had been found playing chess. He reports the discovery to the Pope and concludes, but this we have said, that it may be known from the correction of another how shameful, how senseless, nay, how disgusting this sport is in a priest. It seems a bit harsh for a, a game of chess, but anyway. Um, ultimately, of course, um, Dylan alluded to the fact that chess was associated with gambling because of this introduction of dice uh, in the game. Um, but the argument kind of um, veered uh, towards it being a worthy pursuit because it was considered to be such a game of strategy and skill. Um, and certainly by the, um, the 13th century, the church was gradually relaxing its view on the game um, and chess vocabulary was widely employed in sermons. Now, unlike bishops, knights were positively encouraged to play chess. It was seen as a means of sharpening their strategic thinking. The ability to play chess had become an important qualification for the heroes of epic poems of chivalry composed between about 1150 and 1250. Guidance on appropriate behavior formulated in instruction manuals were produced in large numbers in the 12th century, and some specifically promote chess um, as a social accomplishment, such as the Disciplina Clericalis, the clerk's instruction by Petrus Alfonsi, which cites chess as one of the seven knightly skills. In considering the comic talents of the chessmen, I have placed these two together quite mischievously in a way. Um, the upright knight on the right um, seems to be in complete opposition to his rather hapless companion on the left, who is clearly having a bit of difficulty staying on his horse. So you see how he sits at this angle um, and how much more agitated the drapery is here, giving a sense of movement or instability. However, as with my previous combination of the two warders, these two pieces were probably never intended to be seen together or even to occupy the same board. Um, they have features which suggest that they were carved by different craftsmen, the modeling of the horse's jaw, 
This is a beautiful detail, by the way. This is wonderful. Uh, the way that the lance is, is carried and the drapery, as I mentioned before. The slightly precarious posture of the smaller knight is likely to be a consequence of the carver navigating the curve of the walrus tusk. So I'd just like to make a few concluding comments. Um, with some short points about context and style. These two figures ornament the side of, a, of the shrine of St. Gotthard in Hildesheim, Germany, and date from about the same period as the Lewis Chessman. They depict St. Thaddeus and St. James, and although they are modeled in the same vein as the chessmen, prominent eyes, downturned mouths, etc., they rarely raise a smile from anyone. The chessmen, free from the structure of a saint's shrine, which inevitably conditions our response, um, and endowed with th great three-dimensionality, occupy a very different place in our imaginations. They inhabit the secular world of leisure and play, and this undoubtedly contributes to the, to the responses they elicit from a modern public. Their gloomy little faces are not intended as an expression of inner angst, but are simply part and parcel of the stylistic considerations that governed their manufacture. Now, from the evidence provided by the visual arts, it appears that no one breaks into a smile much before the 13th century, um, when this beaming angel from Rand's Cathedral was erected to decorate a doorway. And this angel was placed on the ceiling of Henry III's painted chamber in Westminster between about 1263 and 1266. Earlier in 1240, Henry documented the courtly fashion for smiling angels by insisting that two angels carved for the chapel of St. Peter ad vincula in the Tower of London should have cheerful and joyous countenances. But to end on a rather more somber note, we should also consider the game of chess itself as um, the defining context for our understanding of the chessmen. As noted, um, it is a battle game and the pursuit of it has generated famous feuds in chess even into the modern age. Few were probably as lively as this, illustrated by Renaud de Montauban between about 1462 and 1470 from a manuscript illumination at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, this is probably the ultimate depiction of chess rage. <laughs> the figure on the left is wielding, um, is actually um, receiving a fatal blow from a sword. Um, and the, while the young man on the right is wielding a chessboard as a weapon. From its very inception, chess was played in earnest and emotions ran high for those involved in the game. Snorri Sturluson's Heimskringler, written in about 1230, describes a historic event involving a, a game of chess between King Knut and Earl Ulfa. And when King Knut and Ulfa the Jarl were playing chess, the king made a bad move, and the Jarl then took a knight from him. The king put his men back and said he would play another, another move. The Jarl grew angry and threw down the chessboard. Now, sadly, the story doesn't end um, with this tantrum. The saga goes on to relate how Canute had Ulfa murdered the very next day. And the list goes on. In the 13th century, court records from the city of Bristol document how a certain Juliana was winning a game of chess against her male opponent when he promptly withdrew his sword and struck her in the thigh. She died of her injuries. So, so much for chivalry. Um, so, really, to conclude, chess, then as now, um, is not played for laughs. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> it was impossible for me to conceive of an afternoon of lectures in conjunction with the Game of Kings that would not have included our next speaker, my colleague, Charles Little. Since the time of his dissertation at the Institute in the late 1970s. He has been a specialist of medieval ivory carvings, an expertise manifest in his numerous articles on the subject and the conferences and exhibitions about ivories to which he has contributed. Currently, along with uh, James Robinson, he serves on the advisory board of the Courtauld Institute's Gothic Ivories Project, which includes, uh, among other things, um, which is focused on an online catalog of ivory carvings created between the 13th and 16th centuries. Charles 
uh, Little's expert knowledge of the medieval Scandinavian world in which the Lewis Chessman came into being dates to the time of his organization of the Viking exhibition in 1980 the last time until the Game of Kings that the medieval departments of the British Museum and the Metropolitan have collaborated so completely in planning an exhibition. In addition, Chuck has worked assiduously during his tenure at the Metropolitan to augment our collection of medieval game pieces, whether for chess or for backgammon, and today to dispel any notions that you may have that the Middle Ages was all about doom and gloom, he will speak about the medieval antecedents of PlayStation 2 and Wii. Chuck. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, yes, I was going to mention this is the second happy collaboration with the British Museum uh, for an exhibition, and thanks to to Barbara's uh, endeavors and to James to make the pilgrimage of possible of the Lewis Chessman to reside here for some six months is a very uh, happy occasion. I'd like today to, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the forerunners of the game of chess uh, and other board games and other kinds of games that were known in the Middle Ages using in large part uh, objects from the Mets uh, collection. And uh, we will look at the few games before the age of computers and television and all these popular games for which I'm totally unfamiliar, I must be honest. Uh, but the, um, uh, the ones that we do have in the Mets collection are really quite extraordinary. I will focus on one uh, figure from the Mets collection that's directly related to the Lewis Chessman, uh, but also looking at other examples. But let's first look at some of the forerunners uh, of the game of chess. Um, it was known, certainly, from the ancient world, uh, games of chess, uh, games of, of, of board games, not necessarily chess. Obviously, we've just heard about that. Uh, and the, the earliest Western examples uh, are known primarily from archaeological uh, sources uh, in Western Europe. And we know that it, some forms of games uh, existed both in the Roman Empire, but also in the Celtic world, uh, and it was widespread, popular, and culturally a significant uh, phenomenon, uh, even among the Celts, who you don't often think of being interested in playing games, more in conquest. Um, and, uh, but it is known from the first millennium AD uh, that there were uh, very interesting games uh, that survived uh, both uh, in Ireland and in Great Britain uh, during this period. We have, for example, from the, the seventh century, uh, from archeological strata of an excavation in central Rome itself called Crypta Balba, uh, a set of, of game pieces in glass uh, and dice, and, uh, and we'll have a detail of them there. That's the, that's the, the box from which they came. It's been reconstructed. Uh, but there is the, the game board uh, for which uh, the, uh, the game was played. We don't know the moves of these games, though. That's the unfortunate thing. Uh, there was no uh, printed or published set of rules for them. Uh, it does have uh, 26. Uh, there's another set that's known from uh, Colchester, England, that uh, obviously under Roman dominion uh, from the first century AD that comes from Colchester and there's 26 glass pieces uh, from that uh, setting. The game uh, it, in Rome was called 12 Scripta uh, and we have pieces that are dated because they're bone from radiocarbon dating to around uh, uh, the first century BC to first century AD. Uh, linguistically, from the Irish sources, we know that there was a, uh, the game called Fidgel, uh, and the Fidge meaning wood and Chittle meaning intelligence seemed to imply that there was some level of intelligence of special status uh, for such games. Thus, board games uh, of, of this nature uh, indicate uh, that there was a certain active interest on various strata of society. But let's look at uh, another games, and we, we know that they are known from other linguistic sources, from Irish, uh, Fidgel, to Welsh, Gudabal, uh, which is much, must have been very much like the Irish game Fidgel, uh, and others called Mersal, a board game which had uh, O's 
and uh, X's that was pretty much like our tic-tac-toe, it sounds like, and some evidence of that survives too. And we know that certainly from medieval literature, almost all the heroes of literature played games of chess or other games, uh, which was very much part of their education, whether it be Tristan in the, in the great German poem, uh, Alexander in the Alexander romances, and Lancelot in the Lancelot prose. Celtic literary sources referred to the games as men, or fur, as it is in Irish, a metaphor which finds visual expression in two examples from 5th to 7th century Scotland. Two uh, face decorated cones in, in stone were found in Scalloway and Mail in Shetland and Shetland Islands in a location of a broch, which is something like a, a, a fort or a castle. Um, that are dating from the seventh century or eighth century. Uh, these are, uh, some were undecorated uh, cones, some were stone of various counters of sorts, again, for a game uh, that we don't know too much about, but also flat bottom pebbles and dice were found in these contexts. In, uh, uh, and you can see, we've saw, just seen from James's uh, uh, explanation of the uh, uh, of the rooks of the Lewis Chessman uh, how they are fierce uh, figures and one wonders if the uh, morphology of these forms of figures um, uh, in cone-like shapes uh, didn't echo back to ancient uh, earlier forms from the Celtic world uh, for which they must have been some kind of board game uh, but we don't, again, know too much about that because there's no written documentation. And as we know that uh, from Irish literature also that uh, there were injury involved uh, in such uh, games as this vigil, which are implied using these conical type uh, objects that we see here, uh, because in several cases they've been described uh, as being becoming embedded in the victim's skull. Uh, so we know that their the games must have become uh, rather uh, uh, active in, in some uh, form or another. And uh, as James has uh, explained, we know from already from the 13th century that these games could become uh, quite uh, actively uh, competitive, if not downright uh, deadly. In 1276, on the error roll, there's a case in which David of Bristol and his Juliana, as, he, as uh, James described, um, were engaged in a game, and uh, he ended up uh, injuring her, and she died. And it said, he fled. Uh, at same uh, sources describe uh, William of Wendon in 1254 of Essex was playing a chess game with a knight of Essex and they quarreled also and the knight squire knifed him in the stomach. William fled at once. Uh, so we know that these games could be quite, uh, quite active. The, uh, the, the game of, of uh, board games uh, that we have surviving. Uh, the mention of the, the great uh, Viking exhibition we collaborated on some years ago with the British Museum included this uh, uh, Irish game board uh, on the left and also a, a, a set of glass um, uh, counters uh, from a, a game board uh, that and the one on the left has I think 49 uh, positions. It must have been sort of a peg form game uh, that uh, was maybe something like a forerunner of our game of, uh, of, of checkers or something of that nature. But using uh, dice was obviously the one uh, element that determined the next move quite often in these various games uh, that showed uh, some skill uh, but also luck. But before turning to other games of the Middle Ages, let's examine uh, in some detail one of the extraordinary Romanesque uh, figures in the Metz collection that has a close uh, relative uh, in the, the chess figures. And uh, the, the chess figures that survive from the Middle Ages are numerous. Uh, this set in Copenhagen, not a complete set, obviously it's a, uh, from various different sets dating from the, uh, the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries and even uh, the form of the famous set that's in the Cabinet Medaille in Paris 
uh, showing total, quite a, a different form, very large uh, ivory carved figures, very three-dimensional, uh, known as the, the set of, no, thought to be that of Charlemagne himself, uh, but it actually dates from the 12th century coming from Sicily and it merges a lot of these traditions that we have from both the Islamic uh, Mediterranean world and the north uh, during this period. But let's look at this figure uh, that is on exhibition in the, uh, at the cloisters at the moment, normally shown down here because it came in 1911 uh, from the celebrated collection of uh, J. Pierpont Morgan who acquired this medieval walrus ivory bishop uh, in Paris and he paid about 3,000 pounds for it, which was an extraordinary amount at the time. The bishop sits on a high-backed throne and is vested with a cope and an alb and a gabled uh, mitre. He grasps the coat closier, crozier in his left hand while offering a benediction with his right. To his right is a genuflecting uh, tonsured figure with a short tunic who points to an open book that it's inscribed with lines. To the bishop's left is another youth with longer hair, not tonsured, who holds a short staff in his right hand and lifts his left to his head. The high back throne um, is decorated. Here's a back view of that throne, and so we've seen similar things to that just now, uh, that is not unlike that of the Lewis Chessman. And it's interlaced with this vine scroll, very rich, fleshy vine scroll on both sides, and it's pierced through the back. Uh, and as an open work object. It stands just four inches tall, terribly monumentalized here in this image, uh, but one can immediately see that its uh, uh, relationship to Lewis Chessman is physically uh, within their uh, range of the 16 Lewis Bishop figures that survive. Uh, his general stylistic affiliations is immediately evident but the New York bishop is not one of them for the simple technical reason that the open work uh, handling of the vine scroll acanthus on the throne and the open work construction of the throne is not found on any of the Lewis chessmen. That's the back of the Lewis chessmen and the back of the New York uh, one on the right uh, with the Lewis chessmen. So here we have these uh, uh, fleshy, uh, open um, uh, forms of the, of the construction of the acanthus uh, that are similar but not exactly like those on the Lewis Chessman. So, and if we go back to, to look at the, uh, uh, the, the forms here, uh, we can see that there's similarities but also differences, especially with the drilled pupils of the eyes of the bishop. Uh, uh, on the Lewis Chessman, not all of them, of course, but, uh, but unlike that of the Met one, which does not. Aside from the 16 bishops uh, of the Lewis Chessman board, there are very few comparable works in walrus uh, or whale tooth or elephant ivory to compare uh, the New York figure. Several uh, chess bishop, bishops uh, have a, a company such figures and we as attendants or counselors. Thus a bishop uh, that's in, that was in Leipzig, it's now lost we think, uh, is of interest but it is known only from a 19th century image. Here we see uh, two youthful attendants, one with an open book and the other holding a pallium, sign of his uh, status, uh, that has crossed the lap of the bishop. A damaged bishop group in the British Museum, which uh, uh, James alluded to is missing its head and, and other ones also, because that is an area where they often break off, but we know it's a bishop because of his, um, his crozier that he holds. And he also has attendants uh, next to him uh, with books and a, a harp in front of him. As part of the medieval courtly culture, the representation of such figures that included attendants is not surprising. A queen, uh, a chess figure, um, with an attendant, <laughs> uh, two attendants, uh, one uh, with a musician with pipes, um, is in the museum in Schwerin in, in northern uh, uh, Germany, uh, and it's a 
seems to be about the same date as the Lewis Chessman. This figure is one of the closest comparative figures to the Morgan figure, uh, but it's slightly smaller and possibly from another related set. Uh, as chess developed as a, as a courtly pursuit, the embellishment of the game with attendance seems to have been a logical uh, development. So who are these attendant figures to the bishop? Are they advisors, personifications, or do they have some symbolic significance? One of the figures uh, uh, with the New York bishop seems clear at first. Although clearly tonsured, the figure on the, the left, um, he uh, points uh, to a book that has lines in it, and as if to display this uh, to the world. So the reason for him being associated with the bishop is somewhat enigmatic. Likewise, the opposite figure sits and stares out holding a short staff in his right hand and with large left hand, he raises it to his head. He wears a long tunic and would thus also appear to be a secular figure. One may try to interpret him as sloth, uh, that is uh, evoking slumber or illustrating uh, spiritual torpor but his action is not clear. Or uh, may he, uh, one may see him as a dejected, slumbering, perhaps a teacher, signified by his staff, who is placed opposite the one who leads the active life of reading and learning versus his status as more of a slothful figure. So such figures are more often associated with abbots uh, than bishops. The transformation of chess from its Indian and Chinese uh, origins to the Islamic roots and the, and the Western world we've seen already today. And it's a subject rich in nuance and significance. But the emergence of the bishop chess figure in, uh, is a later and Western development. How is his appearance to be understood? And uh, James already referred to the, the extraordinary critical letter of Peter Damien to Pope Alexander II in 1061 about uh, the game of chess and uh, the, the, the ungodly use of chess by the Bishop of uh, Florence in his uh, condemnation of it, saying how shameful and senseless and disgusting it really was in his complaint uh, to Pope Alexander. More germane to the evolution of the position of the bishop is the uh, co communicloquium of the Franciscan of John of Wales, written in 1260 to 1282, for it gives meaning to the allegorical nature of the game. And this is a wonderful passage which I wanted to quote to you. The whole world is like a chessboard of which one square is white and another black, following the dual state of life and death, praise and blame. The society of this chessboard are men of this world who are all taken from a common bag, placed in different parts of the world, and as individuals have different names. One is called a king, another a queen, a third a rook, a fourth a knight, a fifth a bishop, a sixth a pawn. However, the rule of this game is such that one man takes another, and when they have finished the game, just as they came out of one place and one bag, so they're put back in one place without distinction between the king and the poor pawn, as rich and poor are together. The author goes on to describe the moves of saying how the bishop uh, moves and captures obliquely because all prelates are corrupt and greedy, he says. He returns to the idea of conflict because at another level of meaning, the whole game is played against the devil. To be checked is to fall into sin. To be mated is to be damned to hell, from which there is no redemption. The elephant was the precursor of the bishop, just as the horse became the precursor of the, of the knight. And the vizier, or wise man, became the queen, as we've seen. The evolution of the game as part of the knightly culture of medieval Europe established the condition for the changing roles and the names of the pieces. It may be no coincidence that at the same time that we witnessed the rise of the princely bishops in Etonian and Romanesque Germany, the figure of the, of the queen, uh, that the, the bishop also makes his appearance at exactly the same time, thus reflecting not only his uh, ecclesiastical status. 
Therefore, in terms of their position and allegorical uh, significance on the board, the bishop took on an enhanced role dictated by his rising position within the courtly culture. So the appearance of bishops with or without the latest fashion in mitres is of some interest because there are no references to chess bishops in any documentary sources until after the year 1200. So is it possible that the image preceded changes in the terminology? From where could such a bishop come from? And we've already seen this from what James has said, uh, that the, the New York bishop is so closely related to those of Lewis in their style as almost a stylistic cousin. And this is most revealing in the, uh, the scroll work on the back of the, of the throne. And this as strongly points to uh, the, the town of Trondheim uh, in, in Norway, where uh, these objects must have been one of the main centers of production, uh, especially for ivory carving and walrus carving at this time. The type of mitre of the bishop is often utilized to establish the date of the figures and by extension that of the Lewis chessman. And usually these are dated from the second half of the, of the 12th century. And this is so called because the type of mitre uh, that, the, uh, that the bishop wears is known as the gabled mitre, uh, which first appears both in, in Germany and English seals of the second half of the 12th century. The bronze effigy of a bishop, uh, Frederick van Witten, in Magdeburg Cathedral, and he died in 1152, shows the further development of the mitre. You see him there on the right in a detail. Uh, the Magdeburg uh, figure seems to be a barometer of representing bishops during the second half of the 12th century, when the gabled mitre becomes more common. And thus the Morgan bishop is chronologically not much later than that, and as one of the closest cousins of the Lewis chess figures, deserves an important place in the development of chess figures in the Middle Ages. One other type of figure that is closely related in bishops is a fairly new uh, uh, piece that's uh, now in, in, in Paris. Uh, and you can see it here, and he has a type of a mitre uh, that is a little bit like what uh, Dylan showed earlier on, on some of the Islamic pieces, the small knobs, uh, and in fact, the, the top of it uh, has uh, these suggestive knobs uh, indicating it's a, a transitional piece from the Islamic type uh, to uh, the Western version of a bishop. So it's within this context that uh, these figures, uh, the, the New York uh, bishop joins his cousins uh, and the Lewis Chessman, as we see here. And the kind of board that was surviving, or we don't have the, the Lewis Chess board itself, uh, but it, uh, it, its later uh, form can be seen in a wonderful example from Italy from the uh, 15th century uh, that we have here at the Met. Uh, beautifully uh, carved uh, in, in bone, ivory, and ebony. And there we see that board with a folding board to make it more portable and accessible uh, for people uh, to, to take uh, the game with them on their travels as the court at culture during this period was highly itinerant. Well, one of the fantastic works that we have in our Metz collection, and looking at a few things that we have here, representations of the game of chess, uh, uh, is a fragment of a cassone. Um, you can see upstairs in the, in the, in the, in the, in the European Paintings Gallery, uh, executed by the painter Librali da Verona around the year 1475. Uh, it, Unfortunately, this cassoni was cut up. The cassoni is a, is a marriage chest, uh, uh, highly popular in, in Italy during the, the 14th, 15th century as, as, a, as a marriage uh, a gift. And this one has narrative scenes on it, um, but it, one of the most delightful images on it uh, is this chess match uh, between this 
dewy-eyed blonde beauty uh, in the process of being checkmated. I'll let those of you who know more about the game of chess, whether um, it, it reveals an end game, I'll let you decide, and uh, the game uh, will tell you more about uh, how the, this love match ends up. Is uh, love trumps all, and, and here the chess game is just a means to an end. We also mentioned earlier, uh, I think uh, Dylan mentioned the, uh, the treatise, which is one of the most pivotal uh, documents uh, of the game of chess by the Dominican Jacobus Cesolius around 1300, became extraordinarily popular. And uh, William Caxton in the later part of the 15th century in the invention of uh, book printing, uh, printed one of the earliest examples of it uh, from about 1475. Uh, that was, had an extraordinary uh, popularity uh, throughout uh, Europe. And that's a copy of one of his treatises on the left in this, to evoke that match. Let us turn, though, to another form of game uh, playing uh, because uh, it was the other popular game other than chess that uh, prevailed in Western Europe uh, during uh, the High Middle Ages. And that is the game of tables, uh, played an unlike chess, which is, uh, had 32 figures. It had 30 uh, on each side. Uh, it was a, a table game, uh, a precursor to the game of backgammon. We'll see examples of that in a few minutes. Um, but we happen to have uh, a series of, uh, of table figures, or table men, uh, that represent extraordinary episodes on these uh, figures. And the ones that are shown here are devoted to the themes of Samson, uh, the, the Old Testament hero, um, battling uh, his mythological uh, predecessor, Hercules. And uh, the, the juxtaposition of these two heroes uh, from the ancient and biblical world uh, is quite extraordinary. Um, we have surviving of about, I think, about 50 of these uh, game pieces, not all from one set, uh, these different subjects. And they include Samson and foxes, Samson slaying Philistines with the jawbone of an ass, Samson tearing the gates of Gaza, Samson's love for Delilah, and the Philistines coming upon the fettered Samson, uh, Samson accusing, uh, Delilah accusing Samson of mockery the shearing of Samson's hair, Samson destroying the temple of the Philistines, the burial and mourning of Samson, and other themes of, of him, which we'll see in a few minutes. These are often opposed, and these discs are uh, about um, uh, three inches, up to three inches in diameter, uh, show the themes uh, equivalent uh, subjects from the, old, from, the, from the ancient world of Hercules, including uh, his birth, uh, him struggling with serpents of Juno, Hercules shooting centaurs, Hercules feeding Diomedes to his man-eating horse, and Hercules Hippolyta, Hercules killing the Geryon and killing of the Caseus, and Hercules and the apples of the Hesperides. These are all of the heroic uh, feats of Hercules um, that are known uh, from ancient uh, um, mythological literature. The models for the imaging may come from um, texts that compare the lives, and there we have two of them together there, uh, Hercules and the apples of the Hesperides. Um, on uh, on the, the left, it's the, the serpent who's uh, protecting the tree with the apples in it. Uh, opposite that of Samson uh, and the foxes. And uh, the, the game here, like that of chess, uh, is two opposing sides of, uh, of similar sized discs and decoration. In the case of the one on the right, it's stained red, uh, taking the material from the matter plant uh, is recommended uh, to stain the, the, that side of the set so it can be distinguished from the, 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 the more neutral uh, natural color of the uh, Morris ivory on, on the left. 
The model for the images uh, may come from texts that compare the, their lives, the Ecologues from a ninth century treatise of Theodolf of Orléans, uh, Orléans uh, and interpret them quite literally, allegorically, and gave the moral meanings in his uh, Ecologues. And he says, uh, Hercules was a strong man whose virtue of fortitude is finally outweighed by his vices of lechery and pride. So eventually he, he obviously believed that Samson would triumph. As these narrative uh, game pieces, and there's another uh, set on the left and right, that of the, of the Hercules on the left, and on the right, Samson uh, slaying the Philistines, uh, which is now in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. As these narrative game pieces are all produced in the city of Cologne, uh, one of the great centers of carving of, of uh, ivory in the Middle Ages, they're made uh, mainly of walrus, a material that was readily available in, in Northern Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries. These games and chess were considered games of chance and luck uh, since they were dependent upon the roll of the dice. So originally the attitude of the church was highly critical as we've seen and that uh, explanation of Alexander and uh, Peter Damien and his complaint about the games to Pope Alexander uh, II. One wonders whether these games can be more specifically uh, identified with particular patrons. Uh, here we have again the, that of the Hercules uh, battle, uh, the Geryon uh, on the, the left, and that of the King uh, Di of Hercules uh, throwing King Diomedes to his man-eating uh, horse on, on the right. It has been proposed that these works produced in Cologne towards the middle of the uh, 12th century uh, could have been commissioned uh, by someone named Solomon, uh, and we have several names of Solomon in Cologne at this time, uh, but it's hard to really be more specific uh, than that if there is, in case, any particular patronage connection here. And even uh, from our own collection on the right uh, at the Cloisters, uh, another episode of, of Hercules uh, being uh, led by a boy, the blind, uh, blinded uh, Hercules being led by the boy, and uh, him in prison on the left, uh, grinding at the millstone. Uh, the episode of that, of course, is the tearing down of the, of the, of the temple of the Philistines uh, that follows this episode. Well, we happen to have a few game boards uh, that, uh, from which are quite uh, uh, interesting examples from the 12th century uh, for which uh, these uh, such game pieces we've just seen would have played on. Uh, this particular one was uh, discovered in excavations at the Abbey of Saint-Denis, uh, just outside of Paris and dates from the 12th century. Uh, and it shows how the game can be played uh, with 32 uh, sets of, of figures, of, of discs, of tables. Another unique series of tablement shows several scenes of the ancient legend Apollonius of Tyre. Known to most of you uh, through Shakespeare's retelling of the tale as Pericles, Prince of Tyre. The story is rarely illustrated in the late antique uh, sources, but it does survive in a few medieval game pieces. The museum was fortunate to acquire a unique example of this theme. It shows an episode on the left uh, from the elaborate complex uh, love and loss epic of when Apollonius, the uh, wife, his wife dies, he has her buried at sea. Uh, and two men are seen here lowering her coffin into the sea from the ship and billowing sails of, uh, and the hair of some of the figures suggests the activity uh, and the, the drama of this particular moment in a very beautifully uh, articulated, deeply carved and highly illusionistic uh, uh, carving from Cologne of the 12th century. Uh, this figure uh, it now appears, this uh, disc on the left appears to have an equally uh, majestic uh, uh, companion in another episode that shows Apollonius learning of the terrible 
famine in Tarsus, and he comes to the rescue of the citizens of the stricken city with a ship full of grain. He pours it out of a sack into the hold of the ship so that uh, this uh, would uh, help uh, the, the city of Tarsus survive the famine. So what have uh, these two, and here's another view of that beautifully articulated uh, game piece uh, that appears to be closely related uh, to the New York uh, figure, uh, Tableman. So what uh, does this have to do with the, the game of tables and what would possibly be the idea behind uh, this subject? The answer may lie in another uh, game piece that is that of the burial of Christ uh, that you see here on the left. It's in the Borough Collection in Glasgow. It is the same size and style of carving and has a composition suggesting that it was part of a related set. And thus the theme of the complete set would have been divided between the, in this case, the life of, of Christ, the burial of Christ that you see on the upper left there uh, with that of Apollonius of Tyre. So what is the connection between the life of Christ and Apollonius? Here we see uh, that the, the, the scene that we have represented uh, would be the burial of, uh, of Christ and the allusion would be to that of Apollonius whose wife, uh, her coffin was washed up ashore uh, near the city of Ephesus and three days later, uh, she was found alive in her, uh, in her, her coffin and saved by uh, the local people of Ephesus. So it, it certainly suggests that, uh, that the subject was a, a connection uh, between the biblical uh, episodes and the passion, perhaps, of Christ uh, with that of the survival and the miraculous uh, survival and resurrection of the wife of Apollonius of Tyre. Some other game pieces uh, are quite whimsical in their, uh, in their forms. Uh, the one on the left that uh, taking the, the theme of these bishops, uh, kind of mocking them in some ways in, a, in a, an amusing way of a, a wild man dressed as a bishop almost, wielding a whack, an, an ax, uh, and uh, writing some kind of a sea monster. Uh, and in other uh, subjects, that you, the great variety that you find on these is seen quite often on uh, subjects that are quite extraordinary. In this case, Scorpio, uh, one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, uh, would have been one subject of a game of tables. Even others that are more mysterious as to what they really mean, uh, the one on the left in the Mets collection, of a, of a hare uh, being attacked by an eagle on the left and that of a, of a group of men being uh, attacked by a bear uh, or it may be a subject from a classical uh, mythology of Menelaus and his companions. Well, they did play uh, these games uh, in the Middle Ages and they quite often were illustrated in many different uh, forms in manuscripts and the famous Lutral Psalter uh, of about 30, uh, 1330 shows a man and a woman playing uh, a, on the a board uh, looking like a, gap, a backgammon board. Uh, they're enclosed within this in garden uh, that is clearly set up uh, for their game, suggesting the board game symbolizes a game of love uh, and also by their gestures uh, that you see here. And we happen to have kinds of uh, boxes in the museum's collection that seem to be suggestive that they are intended to hold uh, game. Fantastic figures uh, depicted on these game uh, boxes. This is a, a wood box, uh, uh, beautifully articulated, and here's the opening uh, part of it to show the division where the, the game discs would have been placed uh, within uh, the box. One of the extraordinary things about this uh, box is the fact that, um, yep, go back to the, the first one, I think. Yes, you can see it very clearly here. It, if you look carefully, 
the, the lid of it is an extraordinary example of dogs, uh, a series of dogs going, uh, profile dogs looking to the left. Uh, but in fact, if you turn it upside down and look at it, they're going to the right in green. So it's kind of a trompe lawyer to fool the eye, a very uh, a, a visual trick that we have extraordinarily few examples from the Middle Ages uh, that show this, uh, uh, this, this playful um, use of, uh, of imagery in this way. And even uh, such little animals as the puppy dog uh, on the right, uh, he looks like he's, he's up for the, the Oscar nomination. I didn't quite, quite get it, uh, but he's, he's quite a marvelously uh, articulated uh, dog. And other game boxes are multi-purpose. You can see here's one. The top of the box is with which you keep your game pieces within. And uh, the top of the box would be that for the game of tables. And the, you, you flip the box over on the bottom of it, uh, you can play another board game, presumably that of chess or some other table game. Well, it wasn't all just uh, uh, games uh, on board games. There are other kinds of games that uh, survive, and the representations of these games uh, are, are quite playful in the context of, of what we have in the museum's collection. When you begin to link these according to pastimes and moments of pleasure uh, and fun. Here we have the game of Quinton shown in two different forms, one on the Solstein Rondel from the end of the 15th century and the other on a box, uh, a so-called mini question as it's known, uh, on the left. And it's uh, a game that was really developed out of a, of a, a nightly pursuit of jousting, training uh, knights. Um, but here the figure of uh, uh, called uh, Quinton, as it's called, uh, is a, a, a balancing game where you kind of kick your partner uh, the foot and try to uh, keep them, get them off their balance. So this type was usually played by, uh, uh, could be played by knights, but also by peasants at the same time. And even in such celebrated manuscripts as the Hours of Jean de Vreux, uh, housed at the Cloisters, uh, this wonderful uh, image of the Annunciation, uh, which dominates the page, and the, uh, the patron, uh, Jean de Vreux, at prayer, uh, in the initial reading her uh, Book of Hours, uh, surmounts a, uh, a, a image at the bottom of the page of a very playful subject. Uh, and it seems to be that of the game called Blind Man's Bluff on the page of the of, of Annunciation. Now, whether this had a, this game is uh, you put your head in the lap of some, of a young lady and uh, cover your eyes and people uh, uh, strike you and you try to guess who it is. Uh, once you've guessed who it is, you're, that person is it. Uh, so how this figures in to the subject of, uh, of the Annunciation uh, is a bit of a mystery. It may simply be uh, the, the contrast of the, um, of the devout life and of Jean uh, versus that uh, of, the, uh, of, of the court, uh, or maybe just the artist having fun here showing this particular uh, subject. But we certainly know this, these games uh, uh, from different representations. Uh, in ivory and in other media, uh, and for example, that of the uh, subject of hot cockles, where uh, the the figure uh, tries to is seated and tries to reach out and and touch somebody, and again, that person is it. These are playful courtly games uh, that were uh, popular uh, in in the period uh, of Northern Europe, especially during the 13th and uh, 14th centuries. A recently uh, uh, acquired um, game box or a, a casket, romance casket, at the Princeton University of Art has on it a very similar uh, scene as we've just uh, witnessed on uh, the ivory that we see here. Uh, again, this very playful gestures of figures having uh, great fun. Uh, and even the Metz collection uh, has uh, depicted on it 
uh, one of the uh, tapestries that we have in the collection, uh, and a monumental version of this game uh, of Blind Man's Bluff, uh, where the, the figures uh, are tormenting the, the youth who's blindfolded in the center, and uh, with the inscription above, uh, uh, Le Temple Salon. So according to the, the times, uh, this playful moment of the figures uh, enjoying their, uh, their, their moment at play in the garden. And even on such humble objects as, as sundials, such games could be represented as we have here on this Nuremberg uh, sundial from the later part of the, uh, of the, of the 15th century. The games of, uh, of chess, though, were the ones that are most frequently represented on various objects of deluxe uh, consumption. Uh, and the pastimes that we see uh, depicted, especially on mirror backs. These are the backside of a, of a mirror uh, that would be uh, representing various uh, subjects uh, devoted to the pastimes uh, of the court and the game of chess, of course, is the one that we see the most often. On, the, on these images, though, the, the, the charm of the young lady is the one that is triumphant. She's the one that's holding the, uh, the, the chess figure. She seems to be in the winning position, as we see on the figure on the far right there. But even uh, more profoundly uh, amusing uh, subjects are found on a, a casket devoted to the scene, the, the biblical scene of the, of the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, here we have, of course, the chess game uh, becomes uh, a, a subject uh, where he's driven out uh, and taken his, his wealth on his own, gone on his travels, uh, and lived a, a, a luxurious life in the company of courtesans. And uh, as you can see there on the left, uh, he is uh, in the process of being uh, defeated in chess by the young lady, uh, and he's literally lost his clothes. It's kind of a form of strip poker, it seems, uh, before he's uh, thrown out of the young courtesan's uh, household. All of these games uh, are, are, are great uh, uh, of great interest because they give us a glimpse of another side of life uh, in the secular world during the Middle Ages, and certainly that of the games that we even know today of, of field hockey and other uh, sporting games are depicted on such works as uh, music records. These are um, under the bottoms of the seats of choir stalls in the cathedrals, and this particularly playful one in Barcelona Cathedral after uh, the end of the 12th, uh, 15th century, uh, shows uh, how the game, uh, a form of stickball maybe, uh, is played with hockey sticks and uh, is, certainly was a game in its uh, form as it was first uh, developed. So such games were, were very much a uh, part of the, uh, of the culture of the period. Uh, but we happen to have very precious few examples of them. But I thought it would be appropriate to end uh, with one of the most charming uh, subjects uh, that survives of something that is absolutely seasonally appropriate, although not this season, uh, a snowball fight. Uh, and it is a monumental representation in the, the Aquila Tower of the uh, Trento in northern uh, Lombardy, right on the slopes of the Alps in the tower that was erected by the bishops of Liechtenstein at the end of the 14th century. And here we have scenes of a courtly snowball fight. And it's the first monumental uh, landscape we have uh, surviving in Western art, uh, depicted especially with the winter scenes, uh, incorporating the subject of, uh, of a sporting event of sorts. Uh, with this, uh, this snowball fight. And uh, this was one of the uh, scenes of personifying January, the month of January. It had other scenes devoted to the other 12 months of the year, but that of January uh, was uh, 
uh, devoted to this uh, event uh, that was immortalized uh, in, as the first uh, recorded snowball fight that we have in the history of art. Thank you very much. Thank you.